Well, I was asked to uh, talk about renormalization and quantum diffusion, uh, probably in view of some work that Laszlo Erdős, Hwang Tse Yao, and I did actually quite some time ago. And I asked to change my title, and you see it's again a little bit changed. So it's more about diagrammatic expansion and renormalization in quantum physics. Um, <coughs> and uh, I plan to discuss the following topics. I will give an overview about Feynman graph expansions. I wasn't sure which audience to expect. I was thinking of an audience of analysts who maybe don't know much about physics, but I see that I have an audience of experts, so it's probably all going to be way too elementary for you. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll give an overview about Feynman graph expansions and uh, um, related expansions also. And then I will discuss this case of the quantum particle and the random environment. And finally, maybe I have time to say a few uh, um, words about many body theory. Okay, so let's start about uh, Feynman graphs. I think I made sure it won't ring, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, Feynman graphs. Okay, so uh, they were f introduced by Feynman uh, in the context of quantum electrodynamics, and then they sort of became ubiquitous in quantum field theory more generally. And they have always had this aura of being mysterious and also ugly. So. Um, I will try to convince you that they are not uh, mysterious about the ugliness you can decide about yourself, for yourself. Um, they are really a, a kind of a tool to calculate certain integrals. And uh, I can say myself, I didn't grow up with this stuff. I actually hated it uh, when I was a student, but I've come to appreciate some aspects of it. There are some parts of analysis that I don't know how to do anyway, other than with Feynman diagrams. Of course, this is a function of time. Uh, one always tries to avoid too much of it, but uh, sometimes it's useful. And in that context of quantum field theory, um, Feynman diagrams have been used. Uh, formal perturbation expansions were a big topic in quantum field theory already in the 1960s. Names like Bogolyubov, Hepp, and Zimmermann uh, were uh, uh, are known till today, of course. And uh, since the 1960s, of course, a lot has been clarified and added, and new interests have been added too. For instance, there is a whole a group of mathematicians now doing uh, Feynman graph amplitudes with respect to with, with a view of algebraic geometry. And uh, there is also, especially here, um, Riemann Hilbert problems, Hopf algebras. So there are many, many uh, interesting mathematical aspects, none of which I will touch because they concern individual amplitudes of Feynman uh, graphs, and we are more concerned with summing up the, F the Feynman graphs. And uh, there is a big issue of convergence. <coughs> so convergence of the expansion is always going to be a power series expansion, so it's just ordinary power series, and then you, uh, you write the nth order term as a sum over Feynman diagrams, and uh, they are just typically very many of them. So uh, typically when you estimate diagram by diagram, you will get a series with a zero radius of convergence. And that's why I said one has to uh, rearrange the sums if you want to have some kind of convergence, or you do an, an expansion to a finite order. And then you, of course, have to see what the remainder term does. 
And uh, so I mentioned here two basic things, three expansions, which is a very efficient way of uh, uh, resumming Feynman graph expansions. And then there is also the loop vertex expansion, which I will explain also a little bit, uh, which was basically invented and propagated by Manian and Rivasso, who are here at Ecole Polytechnique and at Orsay. Okay, and uh, as I said, uh, of course, uh, one often wants to avoid Feynman diagrams. And uh, to some extent, this is possible. There are very nice proofs of perturbative renormalizability that you can do totally without Feynman diagrams. It's called the flow equation method by Polchinski. And for instance, Christoph Kopper here at Ecole Polytechnique is an expert on this. And that method is by now, for perturbative uh, purposes, better than Feynman graph techniques. So uh, I, I, I expect many things to be superseded eventually. So let me, at the beginning, I'll try to do this both blackboard and uh, uh, screen. I hope it works. Otherwise, I will just switch to blackboard. So. Um, let me start with something very simple. Uh, suppose we have uh, an n-dimensional space and we have a Gaussian measure with the covariance d, so it is allowed to be complex as, lo as long as its Hermitian part is positive. And so if, if you want to have it with a density, then this is uh, basically d mu d of phi would be the determinant of d times <coughs> a to the minus phi bar d inverse phi. And then you have a product d phi alpha bar wedge d phi alpha over 2 pi i, something like this. So that's what this measure is supposed to be. And uh, well, it's a Gaussian measure, so you can calculate all moments. And the second moment is just the covariance d beta alpha. And, um, <coughs> and then the higher moments can be calculated as well. And this is the famous, uh, or in physics it's famous as the Wick rule. Probably it has other names as well. Um, and uh, it takes the form here that if you take a product of the phi's, so you see phi bar alpha phi beta, um, then you get a permanent, so you sum over permutations, and then you get the covariance beta i alpha pi of i. So this is the, it's like the determinant, but you don't have a minus sign uh, for the, per, uh, not a sign of the uh, permutation. If you did the same thing for fermions, you would have Grassmann variables and a determinant. Um, <coughs> okay, and uh, of course, you can convince yourself very easily by looking the, at the case n equals 1 that the permanent grows factorially. Yeah. Um, it's basically the definition of the gamma function which comes out when you do that integral. And uh, <coughs> we will be concerned with such averages quite a bit. Um, and obviously can write down a generating function. So this is not just the Laplace transform of the measure. And it's also a Gaussian. I didn't put any i's in the exponent. So the, it has a plus sign. But that doesn't matter. Both sides are entire functions of j and j bar. OK, and uh, generating functions are extremely popular in field theory because they are, provide slick ways of, of doing calculations. For instance, if you uh, look at our uh, moment of order 2m, then obviously you can um, uh, write it as a derivative with respect to the j's. Uh, by just taking the derivative out of the integral, which is allowed because of the absolute convergence. And uh, then you plug in the formula for the generating function. Actually, there is a pointer, right? Some kind of, yeah, so this is a, uh, so. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, the other one. No, actually, there is another one. Yeah, actually, I like it with this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I can hook onto my formulas. Um, 
OK, so you fish it out of the generating function. You just calculate, calculate a, a derivative of an exponential. And then it's a simple Fourier identity that you can write it also as e to, the, e to some Laplacian acting on the original uh, um, polynomial, or monomial in this case. And uh, the Laplacian is just defined uh, uh, similarly to this quadratic form here, except that there is really a d here. So it's the covariance which appears here. And you have a, a form in the derivatives with respect to phi and phi bar. It's an easy exercise to check that this is right. OK. And uh, now suppose we would like to calculate something which looks like, like a, a partition function of it's usually called phi 4 theory. So we have this um, integral d mu d times e to the minus v. And let's take the v to be quartic. And uh, now let's just be uh, careless and just expand. We expand the thing in lambda. So we expand down minus lambda p to the p to the over p factorial. And uh, yeah, and then we, we of course, we, we, we don't care. So we exchange the summation with the integration. So we get a Gaussian average of, well, of uh, an object like we had it before. Except now we also, since we have a sum over all alphas, we take out uh, p sums over alpha. And then we have exactly this expectation over, uh, over the a Gaussian measure of this monomial. And so we can use our permanent formula. So this just gives some permanent, which now depends on all these alphas. And um, <coughs> yeah, since the permanent, well, now let me show how one builds up these graphs from this. So um, basically, let me try to put what I had here. So what do, what do these things mean? These are these vertices, and they actually get some kind of um, orientation here as well. Let me not uh, try to reproduce everything here. Just. So this is just supposed to mean that these are phi bars, and uh, the ingoing ones are phi's. And then this, uh, this machinery here tells you that you expand down with the exponential Laplacian d. And the Laplacian removes two of these variables. So uh, it will remove a phi bar and a phi here. So it could put a line here. So this act of differentiation. Is, uh, is depicted as a graph. And then you can put as many lines as you want. But uh, you don't have to put them everywhere. So in particular, things could be disconnected and everything. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is the Feynman graph expansion for this example. So it's very simple, in fact. It's just an algorithm for doing a Gaussian integral. and. Uh, well, we have just uh, noted that the permanent grows factorially. And this is a permanent of order 2p because, of, uh, because we have uh, a quartic term. And so, of course, this expansion is divergent. It has zero radius of convergence, right? 2p factorial over p factorial, that uh, has convergence radius 0. So that is the, in fact, the, this is the typical problem you encounter when you do Feynman graph expansions. It's, uh, it's just the, the, the toy example for it. OK. So why are we looking at this integral? Um, well, um, what, so that's the question. What's the set of alphas? I just took it 1 to n, but you could think now of of degrees of freedom of your system. So you could take it literally, maybe, as, as, a, as a lattice in position space. And then you know that n has to go to infinity if you want to take a continuum limit, a thermodynamic limit. So certainly, one is interested in, in, 
in this limit n going to infinity. And if you think of a lattice, then you also know if you, if you think of a discretization, let's say, of a Green's function of the Laplacian, for instance, that this will blow up when you go to coinciding points. So which means that uh, if you think of this limit as a continuum limit, then the diagonal would typically go to infinity of your covariance. And uh, there is nothing that would prevent you from drawing such a diagram. And then you have a problem taking the limit. And uh, <coughs> so this is usually called an ultraviolet problem or short distance problem. And uh, OK, the other uh, question is whether when you finally do your sum over these alphas, so this would now correspond to integrals over x's, whether you have enough decay for these sums to be convergent. And that's typically uh, also not the case. And in fact, the most important physical uh, um, examples are gapless. So well, and not, not only the gapless are important, there are many interesting uh, systems which have a decay. But if you think of a conductor, it's actually characterized by the fact that there is a slow decay in the, in the correlation function. Um, so it's, it's not a stupid way of posing the problem. It's sort of the interesting effects. And so um, what one does then is one does renormalization. And renormalization comes in, in the way of ultraviolet and infrared renormalization. The two are, let's say, operationally very similar, but conceptually quite different. Ultraviolet renormalization is a question of how you make a model well-defined. And infrared renormalization is how to treat it efficiently to avoid artifacts by bad choices. So it's more of a, a technical device. OK, and uh, we'll see this in, in the graphical discussion. OK, and so, so maybe as a little point of contact also to Mathieu's lecture, when you look at uh, trace e to the minus beta h with uh, an h of free particles plus interaction, uh, you can get similar structures, I mean, by using path integrals, for instance. And uh, so the essential question is how you do it with controlled remainder estimates. OK. <coughs> Just to finish this very general introduction before I get uh, actually more specific, I would like to uh, state that actually very many um, quantum field theories or many body uh, models can be cast in the form where you have such an integral and then a product of, let's say, resolvent type operators. So this is a correlation function for 2m points. Uh, you could actually think of one of these uh, reduced density operators that Mathieu introduced. There is also an integral representation for those. And uh, you get formulas of that type. So you should think, I will give examples on the next slide. But you should think of something which you know explicitly. So typically a differential operator and its uh, Green's function then. And, uh, and then you have a, an, an, an interaction piece which depends on phi. And the typical way one derives Feynman diagrams, or in fact, this is a, here it is more of the type of a loop vertex expansion, is you expand these resolvents. Uh, now, again, just formally, you just write a geometric series, first without worrying about convergence. Uh, you write it down. <coughs> and let's suppose, if you have the example, that the i phi is just uh, proportional to phi. Um, then you uh, times times delta, so it's a local interaction. Then this will describe some propagation with some propagator. Then there is a phi, another propagator, and so on. So you will get long strings of uh, propagations um, times these phi variables. This is in fact exactly the structure which we will be analyzing later. 
And I'm telling you this structure is actually generic for many models, also in many body theory. And here is a little list. Yeah, by the way, the V can, of course, also be equal to zero, and, and then it's just a Gaussian average. Um, so I've drawn up a list of examples, which uh, I, most of which I will not, of course, discuss in detail, but most of them are similar. Yeah? So there's the Yukawa model, um, where uh, the Q0 is a Dirac operator, so the gamma mu's uh, satisfy this Clifford algebra. MF is the fermion mass, and then the I of phi is just phi at x, so this is a local interaction. Formally completely similar, although physically quite different, is uh, the quantum electrodynamics case, and the phi is no longer a scalar field, but it's a vector field, electromagnetic field, and it, it couples uh, a slash, so gamma mu a mu. And uh, well, then the action, the, the V is actually more complicated. You have a field strength term. And here there is a trace logarithm of the same object that appears here. Um, and that's the so-called fermion determinant, which you get from integrating over fermionic degrees of freedom. So for us, it's just uh, we, uh, we take an average over the A field of these objects. And actually, the formal and to some extent the combinatorial structure is the same for quite a few different models. So I, I, if you take a many fermion system, which now is again non-relativistic, um, that's a Euclidean model here with imaginary time, then you have an operator d tau minus some uh, kinetic term plus a chemical potential. But anyway, it's a differential operator. And uh, if you take a many boson system, you would also have such an operator. And the difference in the two cases in this is in the sign of the determinant. Fermions have opposite sign. OK, so this just as a little bit of, uh, let's say, a view that many problems uh, take this form, and then you can try to do expansions. And for the quantum particle in a random environment, it's actually um, slightly different in that uh, one also has conjugate complex uh, somewhere. So it's uh, in here that we have yx instead of xy. Uh, so, but it's also of the form that we have a resolvent. Um, evaluated and the H uh, will actually contain a phi because of the randomness. So, and you can now expand all this in Feynman graphs. Um, the Feynman graphs will look a little bit different because the vertices have different uh, structure, right? They, they are more complicated here, but the general idea is the same. You should think of this as a line, a particle line going through, and then the phi's get integrated and the particles uh, start interacting. Okay. So now, after this general introduction, I uh, would like to come to the thing that was ordered for this talk. So uh, for the random Schrodinger system, so I would like to explain about the Feynman graphs one encounters there. And then we will discuss a little bit what their values are. So I will go through a few calculations. And, uh, <coughs> and then there is, uh, will be put to use uh, to show that there is diffusion on a certain time scale. Uh, this is old work, but since I was asked, I, I will review it here. And I don't know how far I will get, but I hope to be to have time at the end to uh, discuss a little bit further along the lines that I just presented here. Um, okay. So, how are we doing time-wise? 
Okay, good. So let me just describe uh, the physical setup. The physical setup is is a famous problem in physics studied by Anderson first at the end of the 1950s, I believe. Um, so he studied a uh, model of, let's say, an electron moving in a crystal. And he, in addition to the crystal potential, which of course gives rise to Bloch waves and all these things, he also put impurities and uh, he then claimed that there is a phenomenon called localization. And at the time, this was so outlandish that nobody believed it. Now, of course, you all know that localization is, has been proven for various uh, um, parts of the, the parameter regime. And the real thing that is open is the thing that was taken for granted at the very beginning, namely that there is actually also a conducting phase of this model. And of course, what I discuss here does not imply anything of that kind because there is no scaling limit involved in that question. That's just a question about infinite time without any scaling. So anyway, <coughs> it's uh, uh, the motion of a particle according to Schrödinger's equation. Um, so we have a, a wave function, and here I, I formulated uh, the Anderson model is really model on a lattice. So you, the, the particle uh, has a kinetic term which describes hopping from one lattice point to the next. So you can think of taking the discrete Laplacian. And um, so you pose some initial condition, psi of zero. You can think of putting the particle at the origin, and then you want to study the time evolution. And um, <coughs> Now the potential, the Hamiltonian has this kinetic term, minus one half Laplace, plus uh, lambda times the potential. And the potential is supposed to be random. And uh, it's a sum. So there is a, a, an impurity at every lattice site. And it has a uh, strength uh, Va. So if a particle gets there, it will get scattered, maybe, from the potential. And um, these Va are supposed to be IIT random variables. So now the, the thing that I called phi before is now the V. So, so this is a random variable. And you see it's exactly of this form, right? We have something explicit plus lambda times the sum over terms which are proportional to some random variable. And um, <coughs> now you can ask what randomness one takes. There is some freedom in that. And the assumptions I would like to make here is uh, that these um, the moments exist up to some order. There are models where one looks at different randomness, but this is one thing which I'd like to assume. And uh, well, if you if you then ask about things like coupling constants, you can fix the m2 to 1. The m2 is what I called d before. And uh, yeah, so we want to have, to have uh, expectations. So we want to have it centered and the odds moments zero. But actually, this is just for stating a general uh, theorem. But I will later on just say we work with Gaussian variables so that we don't have too many terms to discuss. Um, <coughs> and we are focusing on weak disorder. For large disorder, it has been proven first by Fröhlich and Spencer, and then by Eisenmann, Molchanov and by many other people, uh, that there is a localized phase, which is well understood. And I will also focus on three dimensions, because some things are easier in higher dimensions. So there is, there is a similar model the, uh, in the continuum, which is the quantum Lorentz model, which just has the usual Laplacian, and then you have to discuss a little bit what this potential is. Then, you, of course, you don't put delta functions, but you put uh, regular potentials at, at uh, certain points in space. 
Um, it turns out that the, the lattice model is technically quite a bit harder than the continuum model in most respects. Okay, so now this is what I already discussed a little bit, but let me uh, state it once more. So the question is how the solution, starting from a certain localized state, does for large t. And um, <coughs> if there is no interaction term, then these things are just Bloch waves. So uh, you can ha you have some dispersion function e of k, which in the continuous case is just k squared over two, and which in the lattice case is some sum over cosines, which is written here. And uh, the question is, how does, for instance, the expectation of the position operator uh, scale with t? And in this case, uh, it will go like t squared, except if you pick some weird initial condition. But typically, it goes like t squared. So this is a ballistic movement. x is proportional to t. And if lambda is not 0, then the expectation is that if lambda is very small, that x squared goes like t in the diffusive phase. And it remains fixed, uh, localized, uh, so bounded for for localized phase. And uh, okay, so proving this is is one of these uh, major problems in mathematical physics. Okay, so. The object, you know, one, the question is what can one, should one study? I mean, um, one can study Green's functions. A related object which is useful to study is the so-called Wigner function. Uh, the Wigner function is something yeah, which one learns about in the first quantum mechanics course, I suppose. It's the question whether, in spite of not having any trajectories, you can have a formulation of quantum mechanics in on phase space. So where there are, again, positions and momenta. And uh, in fact, you can do that. And uh, the function is defined in this, uh, first of all, weird looking way. But it's not actually very weird at all if you think of um, if you think of a pure state in quantum mechanics and think of the projection onto this state, which usually is written like this, uh, then in physicists' notation, if you look at its uh, um, kernel, right, then the, you take x and y, so then this is psi of x times psi of y conjugate complex. And so you identify that if you have psi of x and psi, psi of x and psi bar of y, this is really just, let's say, the integral kernel for this projection operator. And then this depends on x and y, and you try to somehow formulate it that you have a dependence on the relative coordinate, x minus y, and, and maybe the center of mass coordinate, but then it doesn't really matter. But this combination of plus and minus y half really just says we do a Fourier transform in this relative coordinate to get the v. So we have, uh, we take the Fourier transform here. Now in the physical definition, of course, there is a, there are some h bars involved, which I dumped here. We uh, didn't have them in the Schrödinger equation anyway. Okay, so this is uh, easily verified to be a real function. And uh, the only, so you could think of it as a density on phase space. Phase space now being, uh, so position x and a dual variable v, which is like a velocity. But um, <coughs> it's not a density in the sense of a positive density. It can take either sign, and in fact, it is positive exactly if the state is a Gaussian state. So it's very, Normally, it is, uh, takes negative values. And uh, 
well, that's just a feature of quantum mechanics that you cannot represent it simply with positive densities on phase space. There are variants where you uh, where you um, average, so you, you get some, you don't have it pointwise, but just in average sense, it's called the Husimi function, that can be positive if the averaging is such that the uncertainty principle is satisfied. Okay, and so then, um, sort of other obvious features of this function are that if you uh, integrate it over x, uh, then you get the, the distribution, the quantum mechanical distribution in, in momentum space and the other way round. And in fact, if you take a second Fourier transform in the x variable, which we will do later, it's an easy calculation so to see that it just gives you this combination of psi and its conjugate complex in momentum space. Okay, so this is a continuum definition. If you want to do this on a lattice, you have to be a little bit careful because of this one half here. That doesn't really work, but then you uh, sort of go on to a lattice with half the spacing, and uh, if you define it properly, then it still works essentially in this way. I will not go into any details of this. This is uh, not so interesting. Okay, and if you rescale, x, then, okay, um, yeah, w is, is essentially psi squared, so you want an L1 uh, behavior for the density, so one has this to keep the integral of w invariant. Obviously, the integral of a w over both variables is the integral of a psi x absolute squared, so we assume this to be normalized to 1, as usual in quantum mechanics. Okay. And now we're going to use the scaling. So this is in the same spirit as uh, many things that are discussed here. We're, we're not looking at the microscopic scale anymore, but we're looking at a larger scale. So we put in some epsilon and rescale uh, these functions. And what I'm going to discuss takes place on the diffusive time scale. So it is, um, as I said, it is um, a scaling limit of the type where you, if you want to go to larger and larger times, you have to make your interaction smaller and smaller. So it's not uh, any statement about, uh, I give you a lambda, let's say it's very small, we can say something about all times, but it's uh, this combined limit. And uh, so, in other words, we rescale the little x to capital X with this factor. So, um, read differently, x is the macro, capital X is the macroscopic variable. And so, uh, in terms of capital X, little x is very large, uh, lambda to the minus 2 minus kappa over 2, and the same scaling, well, a similar scaling for the time, and um, <coughs> but the time is scaled slightly differently, uh, already hinting at the diffusion. So if you have a, uh, the standard kinetic time scale, which uh, I will explain when it emerges out of the equations, um, then you, if you compare to that, you see that the x is still larger by a factor. Uh, so in, in, in the, on the kinetic time scale, you get another factor lambda to the minus kappa over 2 for the x and lambda to the minus kappa over t. So this squared is that prefactor. So that's, this is uh, diffusive scaling. It hints at diffusive scaling already. Okay, so on, on, the, uh, on the kinetic time scale, uh, Erdős and Yao proved uh, the occurrence of a linear Boltzmann equation as the effective dynamics. And on the larger time scale, the dynamics is then given by a diffusion equation. And um, let me just flash this here. 
quickly. So there are some notations, but let's start at the bottom. So here we have our Wigner function. The Wigner function is rescaled. This is epsilon here. And we are looking at the quantum mechanical time evolution at a, t at a time which is scaled with the uh, corresponding time uh, scaling for the diffusion equation. And then we take the average over the randomness. And then we test it with an observable. So this is just a, a smooth function, a test function. And, um, and this test function depends on the macroscopic variables. So it is very slowly varying on the microscopic scale. OK, so this is like applying this object to this test function. And, uh, and then we take the limit epsilon going to zero. Um, and it's the same as if you took, if you tested the function f t x e of v on the observable. And that function solves a diffusion equation with a certain diffusion constant, which is specified <coughs> up there. Yeah. And uh, the localized initial condition in the macroscopic variables is basically a delta as initial condition. <coughs> and uh, so the feature of this uh, diffusion is that the diffusion does not mix energies. Yeah? Diffusion constant is calculated at a fixed energy. And uh, you see that this, uh <coughs> so the diffusion equation depends on energy. And um, only at the end, it gets actually averaged over E of V. Okay, excuse me, could, could you recall what is the small E of V, please? Yes, E of V, uh, so E of V, is v squared over 2 in the continuum case and in the other case. It's, it, there's no change in, it's, it doesn't get renormalized. So let me just do one minus cos in cosine v uh, j, j equals 1 to d. So in our case, d is 3. Um, <coughs> so it's, uh, it's, the, it's the symbol of the kinetic term you started with. And the integration over x there is this a discrete case because you yes yes this is this is for the Anderson model yes and uh, okay so there is uh, <coughs> I didn't say anything about kappa kappa is positive so kappa is actually very small uh, there is an idea that this should work up to kappa equal to two but uh, that was sort of optimistically at the beginning, but then when you start losing <laughs> losing factors in estimates, it gets very small. So I think in the continuum case, one can choose kappa as one over a thousand, but in the discrete case, it's even much smaller. So it's really just a little bit above two, but that makes a big difference for everything. Okay, so and now basically I think at this point I can mainly switch to Blackboard to discuss a few of these things, yeah. Yeah, maybe I do that now. So we don't need the projection anymore, I just unplug it here. Yeah. <coughs> so what I would like to discuss now is how we deal with this with Feynman graphs, right? Um <coughs> Uh, 
And uh, okay, so the way this is done is that we take the Duhamel formula and iterate it. Okay, so um, Duhamel formula uh, looks like this e to the minus i t h is equal e to the minus i t h zero plus integral of zero to t d s e to the minus i t minus s h and then we have v times e to the minus i s h zero sorry I think that's it is there some no of course there is a uh, factor missing minus i lambda v so uh, this is for h equals h0 plus lambda times v like we just had it and uh, is there a zero missing in the at the h in the, in the interval here yeah no there is no zero oh, missing. Okay, so it's it's you see the, this i i will uh okay i wasn't planning to derive the formula you just you just write sort of time ordered integrals but i will actually uh, since i want to in the spirit of the of the introduction let me um do the following um i want to compare it immediately to um to what we had before and um, we can just by spectral theorem and residues write um, This is just a, a, a residue formula which expresses, I mean, of course, you, you know that you can express every function of the operator by its resolvent. So here is the resolvent alpha minus h. So the alpha is moved into the upper half plane by some offset eta. And uh, yeah, if you do this contour integral, then you uh, pick up this one pole and it gives you e to the minus i t h. Yeah. And now <coughs> let's call this, let's say, Rh alpha plus i eta. That's usual notation for a resolvent. And uh, then you may remember the resolvent equation that Rh of set is Rh zero of set plus Rh of set um, v times Rh zero of set. So standard resolvent equation um, <coughs> exactly corresponds to this Duhamel equation up here. So there has to be a, an R because you use the resolvent equation to generate maybe a, a geometric series and it's like this. Yeah. Okay, and um, <coughs> so, uh, okay, and here of course Z is alpha plus I eta discuss this later so this formula will actually be used on a technical level as well you can you can uh, there are two ways of so the procedure is now going to be the following um, remember what I showed you on one of these slides is that we had a covariance uh, or a resolvent which gets expanded this is exactly what you can do in this formula here and then you get exactly the structure that I showed you before with the phi is replaced by v's and um, <coughs> of course you can translate this up here which just means iterating the Duhamel equation and uh, you will always get one term where there is a, a full h and then uh, all other terms where there is just an h h0 in this uh, equation and uh, in fact one can use both of them uh, for doing estimates the resolvent uh, um, representation is preferable because if you 
we will see that if you do things with e to the i s h zero, I mean these are unitaries, you can only bound them by one, whereas in the resolvent case you, you have some some more information somehow. <coughs> okay. And now we can iterate this out and that gives us something like psi of t is a sum psi n of t n equals 0 to n minus 1 plus some remainder term psi n of t and so the psi little n's are then given by whatever minus i lambda to the power n um, the integral and uh, now we have integrals over s so this is over 0 t to the n plus 1 and um, we do have the condition that the sum over sj has to be equal to t so it's the usual simplex of times that get integrated and then we have e to the minus i s n h 0 v i s n minus 1 h 0 v and so on and then at some point we have the initial condition. So this is just comes from from um, yeah you apply this to psi 0 and you iterate and you get the, all these explicit terms here with these insertions of v and um, a remainder term and the remainder term is of course um, Um, well, minus i lambda integral 0 to t t s e to the minus i t minus s h acting on psi n of s. Well, psi n minus 1, yeah. So, oh, there's a v missing, of course, yeah. Okay, so. <coughs> This is the expansion for the uh, wave function. And uh, okay, now it should be now, I mean, look, should look familiar to the case we discussed before. Um, So we, we can still insert now everywhere what this is, right? This was a sum of, uh, let's say, x, or not, let's not say x, alpha, v alpha times um, delta alpha x. And uh, yeah, we insert this everywhere, right? So you see what you get here is a, uh, a long sum over all these alphas of all these terms with the v's placed at these uh, between the free propagations and typically this we will denote now by this graph. Yeah. So So this would be V alpha 1, V alpha 2, and so on, going up to whatever. And we have all these, uh, these lines here correspond either to e to the minus s h, or if we look at the resolvent picture, it would be then something like alpha minus h plus i eta inverse. So now I uh, see we have two alphas, so let me um, yeah, let me not change this. Okay. 
So these are different alphas. OK, um, in fact, I call them A in my notes. So let's call them A here, too. Let's stick to A's here. OK, and uh, yeah, and so we, uh, we actually can think of an interpretation of this sort of in, in, in microscopic physical sense. You start with a psi zero, you do a free time evolution, and then you have an interaction with some v. And uh, if we uh, insert all these sums, then this means basically we have uh, some scattering event at some a zero here. So the numbering here is the wrong way around. And uh, then you propagate again with some such factor. Then you have another scattering. You propagate again. So that's the, the intuitive notion one has about this. Shouldn't take it too seriously, but you you can have you can sort of have an intuition this way. And so the important thing here to note is that these times uh, add up to t. So that's the usual thing and what is usually called time-dependent perturbation theory. OK. Um, <coughs> yeah, and then, then remember what we had. We had a Wigner function, which contains two of these psi's, the psi and the psi bar. And so we have to do this twice and put it together. And um, <coughs> yeah, we'll do this over time. But let me maybe say something else first, namely, um, it is actually very important that we can write it in this way. Um, you could expand now to infinite order, and then you don't know what uh, convergence properties you really have. But since we have this uh, psi n of t here, you see that there is the obvious estimate. So that's the unitarity estimate. And h is self-adjoint, so the norm of psi n of t well, it's bounded by lambda times integral 0 to t ds, norm of e to the minus i t minus s h, v psi n minus 1 of s. So obviously, this is bounded by lambda times integral over ds. So we can just, since this is unitary, we can just leave it out in the norm. And then you can decide what you would like to do. So you could maybe continue with the bound lambda times t times uh, the soup of v psi n minus 1 s, for instance. Yeah. The crucial observation here in this unitarity bound is that you lose essentially a factor of t, um, but you gain uh, the absence of this because now everything is totally explicit. You have, you have. I mean, these these are integrals which you can calculate. This is a way of doing perturbation theory if you want. Yeah, you can calculate every these integrals. Of course, you will discover very quickly that you can basically do none of them explicitly, but you can do, um, yeah, you can do estimates very well on them. And um <coughs> okay, so this is one important observation. And the second observation, which makes it actually useful for us, is that um, the Wigner function is continuous in the L2 norm. So uh, one can actually use it to uh, write down the 
uh, an estimate for the Wigner function. Let me just write it down here so we can easily verify so that we had this integral of the Wigner function with this observable, which I now write in bracket format. And um <coughs> So we are looking at the difference of the true time evolution to the one which is explicit. So this first term in this uh, expansion, so the finite order to Hamel expansion, and that is bounded by, well, there's some prefactor expectation of some psi n squared times t times the soup um, expectation of v. Okay, and then to the one half, of course. Okay, so th this inequality tells us that uh, we have uh, an error estimate for the object we are interested in. Remember, we wanted to show that this uh, converges in the limit. We have a factor t here, which one has to uh, take care of. And then one has this supremum, um, again, of an explicit term. So now there are no h's in the game anymore, but just h zeros. And uh, we can really start uh, estimating contributions. Okay. Um, maybe uh, we can take a break of five minutes. Let me say as a last thing before the break, much of this carries over to the many body case. But when you do this unitarity estimate, in the many body case, you lose connectedness of your diagrams. And that is a disaster. So this is one of these estimates which do not obviously carry over to, or are not obviously useful in the more general setting. So I think uh, we, we can take a little break of five minutes and continue then. Okay, so. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I think my question is super valid. But yeah. um, I mean, you, you prove in the end something that you have a diffusive transport of your yeah. initial condition. And you also said that this is, I mean, that there's no way to make a statement about the spectrum. Oh, I'm not saying uh, there is no way to make a statement yeah, about the spectrum. I just don't know. I mean, that would basically be the question. So how far is that in the way? Is there any feeling how uh, far this is in the way to make it? OK, so there is a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is, of course, infinitely far away. Um, and uh, the long answer is that uh, this is still a short time scale because um, uh, because the diffusion doesn't mix energies. Yeah. In the end, you expect just a diffusion equation which has a diffusion constant which is not energy dependent in, in the way I wrote it down here. Okay. But I guess you would have to go beyond lambda to the minus 4 to see it here, which is, as I said, infinitely far away. <laughs> but you know, maybe one can cover an infinite distance in a finite time. Who knows? OK. <coughs> yeah, so now. now we've warmed up, and now the sports starts, sort of, um, because we have all the ingredients to go into the details. Um, and the first thing one does is, now uh, you remember that the, the Wigner function was uh, this product of um, two psi's. <coughs> and um, what we do is uh, we just write that down and uh, see how it how it turns out. So uh, we we now get 
let me just see this this is the point about Feynman graphs you can actually talk first without writing a huge formula so we have this so we have this for the psi and the psi bar also has this <coughs> structure and now that we have uh, I mean this of course is already implicitly assuming that we have expanded out to finite order which I've just justified to you and so we obviously in general have different orders uh, upstairs and downstairs and uh, okay so then then you get some formula for this and uh, <coughs> if you want the formula for that it's actually pretty lengthy yes so let's see so w n n tilde so we had these external variables v and xi of the Wigner function and then there is all this stuff and so um, So the d mu n would be this. This is d mu n of s. <coughs> and uh, yeah, and then comes all this stuff e to the minus i s n e of k n plus i s tilde n e of k tilde n. And uh, yeah, so. kind of thing you don't want to write on a blackboard but anyway so then we have a product of potentials and we call them v hat of k j minus k j minus one psi hat zero of k zero and, uh, and then we have the same thing so this is j equals 0 to n minus 1, this is l equals 0 to n tilde minus 1. See this is not very nice to write down, but it's in principle it's straightforward. So complex conjugate in general. So all I did is, is, is the following here. First of all, something which I didn't write down here, I can now say, is there any color here on the screen? Um, here I really now want to look at psi, psi hat. So if I start at psi zero hat, then this here acts as a multiplication operator, obviously. And since V is a, is a multiplication position space, it uh, will be a convolution. So we will get uh, K1 minus K0 integrated over K1. Yeah. And then you just go on like this. This is actually this, the structure which you see down here, right? This is exactly this thing, product of, of the Vs. And um, <coughs> so let me draw, uh, label the graph so that we can see this now. So this would be K0, K1. K I now draw it from the left, uh, changing convention. And we have K tilde 0, K tilde 1, 2, and so on. <coughs> And now, to think about these things, um, you should think about momentum flows. And so if you look at this, you have k0 and k1. Let's just uh, take the convention here to uh, draw this arrow here. Um, <coughs> then you see that. Uh, what you get, uh, what we will eventually get are just Kirchhoff rules for, for the flow of momentum. Yeah? 
So you could think of these as pipes and momentum flows here, k0. And then here it's k1. And you can think of the rest, the difference, k1 minus k0 flowing down here. Yeah, so actually, this flowing down here is k0 minus k1, because it has to uh, <coughs> uh, split up. <coughs> and then, OK, so this, for the moment, is just uh, Just ending up at these potentials, and we still have to uh, we still have to integrate over the randomness, or average over the randomness to uh, to get some Feynman graph which we can analyze. So, but this is uh, okay. This is just a straightforward writing out of the thing, and obviously you can do a similar. Um, um, representation just by by taking the the alpha integral which we had uh, actually I just erased it so um, I'm not supposed to write here so let me just say this you can also write it well let me write it in here as well OK, and then we have integral d alpha. At some point, I will drop all these two pi's because it gets too long to write everything. And then instead of all these phase factors, one actually gets the product of c eta's of alpha and kj. So instead of these uh, oscillating factors, we just have and then there is the psi hat 0 of k 0, psi hat 0 of k tilde 0 conjugate complex. And then there is a big factor which I just call v of k and k tilde. So all these uh, potential indices here. <coughs> and the C eta of alpha and k is, of course, 1 over alpha minus E of k plus I eta. OK, so this is just uh, the um, Green's function version of the same formula. And uh, in general, the idea is if you try to do low order calculations most of the time if you want to have a term explicitly this is the better representation but if you really want to analyze high orders then this is the, the best uh, representation or at least the one that's that works best for us um, <coughs> and uh, I should say that this is conjugate complex now, because of this factor e to the 2t eta, which we got from the residues, we will pick eta equal to 1 over t, so that this factor remains just bounded. And so then you see that uh, the situation is you have an integral with a lot of near singularities, and the singularities are just avoided by basically something of the order of t. And t will get large, of course. OK, and, and then uh, the question is how to arrange this sum in order to do anything with it. And uh, of course, this is still a non-averaged W. And um, let me again try color here. If we did expectation. So um, <coughs> then we integrate over these variables. You remember these were sums over uh, little v alphas times some fixed interaction function, in this case delta. So here we will get uh, random variables which are now integrated 
And this integration just gives us, it pairs up these lines like I explained at the beginning. Except that these are real variables, so it's actually even simpler than in a complex case. So what this will do is it's going to connect these lines. Yeah, so then I uh, need some more upstairs to, to avoid. So then we can do this and whatever. I mean, we can pair them up in any way we want. Let's do this and that and then go here, for instance. So that would be a possible pairing. And these are the Feynman graphs we're going to discuss here. So the expectation um, pairs up. And what does the pairing up of the lines really mean? And I will, I will show this to you in one low order example. So you, that you see it in, in, its, in full detail for that. Let me just Okay, so um, we we'll probably don't do only one or two examples. So let's let's just look at this um, <coughs> w one one of c v and let me denote the t here too. So um, as a graph. For the moment, it looks like this. And uh, <coughs> so if we write it down, of course, it's again this uh, rather large thing. And then downstairs we have something similar. Okay, can't you get complex? And when we do the average, of course, in the graphical picture, it's obvious only this can happen. And this is the average of these two factors. And um, <coughs> I'll do this, although it's completely elementary in principle. Um, <coughs> this gives us uh, back translation invariance and momentum conservation actually in, um, at this point. So what we do here is if I put this in, <coughs> let me just do it in the um, create case, k okay, minus k zero minus k tilde zero bar. So what we get here is, of course, you remember that uh, these were all sums over terms associated to different a's. And then we have, we had a delta x a, so we, we essentially get e to the i times, maybe minus i times a k one minus k zero times e to the plus i a tilde times k k one tilde minus k zero tilde. 
And then we have the expectation value of these variables. Let me not have too many v's here. Let me write phi a, phi a tilde. Yeah, this is comes from plugging in the, the potential which we had. It was a sum of, of terms located at these a's. And because they're located, the Fourier transform is just a plane wave. And then we have this. And this, of course, by our assumption, is delta a a prime a tilde. And so we got really only one sum. And you recognize this sum as a, as a, uh, as a delta function. So this will then become delta of k1 minus k0 minus k tilde 1 minus k tilde 0. And this is maybe the most important thing you should keep in mind from this. This means that taking the expectation just continues the momentum flow from upstairs to downstairs. Yeah. And so now when we look at the large graph, we can think of this as a, as a, f as a momentum flow as being continuous through all these, uh, these lines. OK, so now uh, uh, we can plug this in. And then what you get, and what I will not do in, in much detail here, obviously, is uh, that you can do these, uh, for instance, this S tilde integral. And uh, the S tilde integral will turn out to give you a, a, an energy conservation. Of course, it's an approximate conservation because S tilde is only integrated up to T, so you don't get really uh, a conservation, but only uh, a smoothened version of the delta function. But if you take um, this in the limits, let me put this 2 pi to the D if you want. Um, so the W11, all this uh, converges. Uh, in the limit, we're interested in simply to, so expectation value is W1, converges to a prefactor lambda squared. OK, so then there is a, a, a factor T times integral dk0. So and then there is some scattering function, which I remove here, psi hat 0 of k0 times 2 pi delta of e of k minus e of k1 minus e of k0. And uh, <coughs> so the factor t comes from this, uh, well, from the time integral and the identification of this um, energy conserving delta function. What you see here at this end result is you have the kinetic time. This is what's called the uh, kinetic time uh, t. And you have energy conservation, and there must also be momentum conservation, which, yeah, which removes one of the k integrals. And um, this is actually one term in the Boltzmann equation. It's, uh, it's uh, the last term in the Boltzmann equation. Actually, it's the gain term. Sorry, it's the gain term. You have a k0, which goes into k1, which is the thing that comes out at the end. So this term corresponds to one of the terms in the Boltzmann equation. And then there is another graph, which is this graph. where you pair upstairs, which gives you a loss term in the linear Boltzmann equation. So I, I don't want to go into the details of these terms unless you ask me to, but it's more of this calculational uh, stuff. Um, except to say that at lowest order, you identify what the terms in, in the Boltzmann equation are. And then you can imagine that when you iterate the equation, that you will get repetitions of these, and you will get repetitions of these. Uh, and you get a zillion of other graphs, but in fact, those are the important ones. So uh, somehow Feynman graph expansions work always when you the leading term looks simple. If the leading term is already terrible, then uh, it's maybe 
not the best idea to start that way at all. Okay. Okay, I've left out a lot of details uh, in, in this um, calculation, but it's really details of the type that you identify such integrals as a something like sine x over x, right, which is a typical uh, approximate delta function if scaled appropriately. Well, oh, time is really advanced. Um, okay, and so now we are basically at the beginning of, of saying what we, how we could actually estimate graphs. I mean, you, you, it should be clear from this that even doing a one, what is called a one loop graph, yeah, by adding this, you know, you in our count loops in the graph is, is tedious, right? But that's, uh, that's not a bug, that's a feature because, I mean, these things encode all the physical information about, about the model. And these correlation functions, they have a, a lot of interesting structure. It just would, it's not very interesting to write it all down here. What I will now probably be able to do in the rest of today is uh, discuss a little bit how one can estimate graphs in general. And then I will focus on this graph in particular and, and, and show you what its order of magnitude is. Let's see if I can get this done today. And then we, yes. So, so that means these graphs can be summed in the end? Or yes, yes, they're geometric series, in fact. I will show you that. OK, so um, uh, yeah, let's see, what did we want to, did I want to show here? Okay, so one can, um, yeah, first of all, maybe I should, I should still, Done. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't completed this formula. I wrote the e on the left-hand side, but I didn't write the e on the right-hand side. So, <coughs> as I told you, the taking the expectation now introduces all these uh, pairings, and that means by the calculation we just did that we introduce a lot of delta functions, right? So what we really get here now is a sum in addition. So this is because of the expectation. We get the sum of deltas. And uh, let me just uh, write uh, delta plus of k, delta minus of k tilde times delta m of k and k tilde. And since I've written already so much on the board, let me just not uh, write it out what they are, but just describe what they are. Um, <coughs> we have seen in this calculation that the pairing gives us a delta function. Now, this collects all delta functions which are upstairs, downstairs, and the ones going from up to down is in delta m. So now we have basically uh, a complete um, description of our graph values. And we can try to do estimates on these graphs. And uh, yeah, so there are a number of estimates which one can do 
in a very simple way, but which are not all that useful. Um, for instance, you could think of, um, let's look at this upstairs in the, in the representation where we still have the times and the oscillating factors. Of course, something one, one can do in this representation always is you just <coughs> estimate by absolute values and then, then all these oscillatory factors just drop out. Uh, let's suppose, I mean, we, we have already averaged over the V and uh, we, we have this delta function, so I just think of this being uh, uh, replaced by this product of deltas here. Um, then we can do the integral over the s variables. Uh, it's no longer on the board, but you will remember that the s variables were integrated over a simplex, right? t is the largest time, and then the all s's have to add up to t. So the, such a simplex has a volume of t to the n over n factorial. So there would be an easy estimate uh, uh, bounded by lambda to n plus n tilde t to the n over n factorial t to the n tilde over n tilde factorial. And then there is still the integrals with the psi zeros. I just write it this way. And so this is proportional to lambda t to the n plus n tilde over n factorial n tilde factorial. Um, and you see that this is uh, not such a great bound because if we expect that lambda squared t is the appropriate quantity, uh, then this is really very large. Yeah. So it will diverge in the limit, even in the kinetic limit, this is going to be divergent. So, I mean, it's sort of obvious to anyone who, who knows a bit about quantum mechanics, it's a very bad idea to, to, to dump all these oscillatory factors. And that's why one uses, when one starts doing bigger estimates, now one uses this, where you can use absolute values uh, on these factors and still get something useful out of it because you still have a k-dependence in them. <coughs> and uh, the first um, bound I would like to show to you is, I mean, now we can, this is the following. Um, <coughs> So suppose we consider a pure up-down pairing. In other words, there are no um, pairings upstairs, downstairs separately. So it could be something like this, for instance. We don't have anything of this type in here. Uh, then this, uh, the form of the, um, of the value of the graph. So this would be the value of a particular graph in this, in, in this sum over graphs. Um, well, okay, we have all these uh, C's we do have these um, integrals over alpha and beta. Uh, let me just see, do I want to do it with this representation? Um, just sorry. Now let's stick for the oscillatory for a moment. And uh, if we have this, then we have the following structure. We have a function kn of p and t, or little k and t, k and tilde of k tilde and t, 
I'll write down in a moment what they are. Psi 0 of k 0, psi 0 of k tilde 0. And then we have this uh, delta function, which I just described in words. And then we have, let me just write this dn k, dn k tilde. And so what I did here is actually I, the only thing I did is I introduced the shorthand kn of k and t, which is still in the time representation d mu n of s product of e to the minus i s j e of k j. So then uh, the value of the graph takes this form and all we now do is we take a Schwartz inequality of this. We write this as uh, the integration measure, right? This essentially means, maybe I should have explained that first, what do we have here? We have int integrals over all the k's, k0, k1, and so on. And we do integrate the k tildes too, but we have delta functions. So what remains of this? Well, what remains is in general when you have a graph, you can fix momenta in terms of so-called loop momenta. And the way this goes is that one uh, picks a spanning tree of this graph. And uh, for, so, for instance, we would put all these pairing lines into the tree. And in this case, we can also put all of the lines downstairs. This is obviously a tree because we have only up-down pairing, right? They cannot get, you can't get any loop in this way. And so this means, I mean, the general procedure then that you can determine, of course, by the momentum conservation rules, which you have on this graph, you can determine uh, the momenta on this one, right? Because here k0 goes in, k1 goes out, so here k0 minus k1 goes through. And that fixes um, this momentum, then we can do this all here. And then we can go back and uh, fix starting from k0. So in other words, the general procedure is if you have a tree, you know you always have leaves, vertices of incidence 1 and you go in from the leaves and fix all momenta. This is a unique procedure if you have a spanning tree. And now, <coughs> in this case, this just means we can just remove the k tilde integration completely, or we could remove the k integration completely. This uh, is our choice. And uh, the rest of the integrand has an obvious factorization structure here. So let's do just a Schwartz inequality and uh, we will get well and uh, so this is uh, let me allow myself to write it in this way. And now you see um, in this term here, we still have got an integration of a k tilde, but the integrand is independent of k tilde, so we can just kill that. Or in other words, we could also for free replace this by saying Instead of uh, any pairing, we introduce the pairing which corresponds to the identity. So that means we're having so identity pairing is this. Yeah. Because if we do that, then we can again write this as kn. Oh, this should become mixed conjugate, sorry. 
times kn tilde bar. And we see that this is actually the value of the graph corresponding to the identity. And so this general argument shows us, I mean, just Schwarz inequality shows us that the value of a general graph with only up-down pairing, so this is only part of the graphs, is actually bounded in absolute value by the value of the ladder graph. So this is certainly the largest contribution, but as we know, there are very many contributions, so that by itself doesn't tell us too much. But it uh, shows that it might be good to investigate this uh, ladder graph first. And um, yes. At this stage, what you prove is that, say, all the other graphs are bounded uh, from above, well, yeah. from above by the ladder graph, but not the sum of all other graphs. Yes, exactly. Just each yeah, one. Yeah. Each one, and there are n factorial minus one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's exactly the point that one not only one has to prove that I mean it's, it's not sufficient to prove anything for any individual graph you have to look at the sum of graphs yeah and uh, the fact that we have an expansion with a remainder term allows us to do this if we had to expand up to infinite order uh, we'd have a real combinatorial problem for this expansion. So I, I suppose I'm almost out of time, so I will not write this down, but next time I will actually do this calculation for the ladder graph. It's a, an important calculation, and uh, we will see that this is really the term which fits to the kinetic scale, yeah, lambda squared t. And uh, I will also discuss then um, <coughs> the contribution of these graphs and then we'll try to put things together by renormalizing well that's called renormalization you will see that it's nothing mysterious okay thanks that's it for today Order do you expect to see the quantum effects? Because here there's a lot of graphs, and the other one, um, I don't know their name, but uh, you case, essentially yeah. have only classical effects. Yeah. And so, what is the, the order where you would see something like a quantum correction? Uh, oh. I, I Actually, would say all of them are quantum corrections. Yeah. So, so I mean, this of course corresponds to a classical term, which is the reason why there is then a, a classical equation at the end. Uh, but all of these are quantum corrections. So basically, the if you want, the proof is to show that in the scaling limit, the quantum corrections die out. Yeah. But it's. Uh, by itself, the problem is never really classical. It's, uh, it's also not semi-classical. There's no separation of scales between, the, between the, uh, the, the typical, let's say, quantum wavelength. If you think of uh, h bar over p, or, or simply 1 over p for the quantum wavelength, and the, and the, um, the range over which the potential varies also remain the same. This is not a scale separation. Yeah, it's not a scale separation, but for instance, if you look at the fluctuations, do you see the quantum effect? Because this is the law of large numbers. Well, okay, th you would see them if, if you if you try to determine the asymptotics more precisely. In the limiting statement, you don't see them. I mean, the, the, the question that is then interesting is, is um, what happens when you go, I mean, what, when you go beyond lambda squared t, which is, after all, the, the subject of this. And then um, this argument doesn't help you anymore. Then maybe one of the quantum effects is, is this term here, which, uh, which generates um, slightly different scaling behavior. 
and uh, yeah, I've never thought about it in terms of quantum classical, so I'm afraid I can't give any better answer right now. Yes. Um, so you've described here the uh, sort of a weak coupling limit, small yeah. lambda. If you fix lambda, of course, and you look at localized potentials, then Eng Eng and Erdős have, have done this for the kinetic scaling. Mm. Can one also extend this to the to the sort of low density limit, what you are describing here, or are the terms getting too big? I don't know how. I mean, we really need the weak coupling everywhere, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's possible one can do it, but I don't know how. Okay, any more questions? Or maybe online there is something, Sergio? No. Okay, maybe then uh, we go into the coffee break. This course will. Uh, then continue on Thursday morning and we continue in half an hour after that. Yeah.